All right, so today we'll talk about viruses, not focusing on what they do in the wild, uh, but how we as biologists use them as tools, mostly to deliver genetic information to cells. But why to do this? Why, why not use something much more sterile and controlled with, that can be designed to more controllable parameters like uh, lipid complexes or nanoparticles? And the short answer to that is that viruses just work better. And this is likely the case because these viruses have evolved over millions of years to deliver DNA and RNA to cells that actually don't want this delivery to happen, or most likely through these ways either. So this lecture is an overview that will lead to more in-depth lectures in the future. So today I will only briefly discuss most viruses in biology uh, with a bit of a bias towards neuroscience, since that is my field, probably more than a bit then. But I do try to aim as being as broad as possible and talking about as many different types of viruses as possible and touching into as many different uses of viral tools in many different contexts uh, to be an inspiration for your work, but also to see the kind of constraints that we often work with when using viruses and in some ways how they can be um, used properly. And I would also like this lecture to be particularly understandable, regardless of background. And a few people have approached me that come from more quantitative backgrounds saying that they really like things to be more based on first principles and things that are more logically or organized. And I understand the frustration, but it seems like our current understanding of biology is a bit different than that particular structure of knowledge. And for this, I'd like to briefly talk about one of the closest things there is to a first principle in biology, which is the so-called so central dogma. Uh, which is the idea that information flows from DNA to RNA to protein to then having an effect. Now, th this, of course, almost immediately starting having all sorts of exceptions to this rule, from reverse transcriptase that can turn information from RNA to DNA, to some in vitro weirdness where you can get DNA to produce protein directly, to RNA acting as ribozymes, microRNA, prions, and all, all sorts of business. So it basically seems that trying to come up with rules or principles for what nature can and can't do seems to just be asking for nature to disagree and tell us to hold our beer. So if anything also though, these ex exceptions to these principles end up being more interesting than the principle itself and suggest that biology should be approached with a kind of a different mindset. One that prioritizes asking questions about the world and realizing that the answers you could come up with will sort of look like an accumulation of sometimes contradicting facts, but there are ones that give you a lot of power over that particular aspect of the world that you're looking at. So this is why today I decided to group the viruses, not as to some property like their DNA versus RNA structure or capsid or anything, but in their usage loosely. It'll break down as this talk goes on, but I'll briefly talk about usages of viruses in vivo, then in more in vitro slice type preparations, then transition to more in vitro preparations, and then cell-free systems. And of course, I'll end the talk briefly discussing the ways that <clears throat> viruses are uh, cataloged and structured in terms of uh, their actual biological properties, which basically is just very hard to do g given the uh, dramatic diversity that viruses have and their ability to mutate very uh, intensively. For applications that you want to infect animals, uh, the usual targets are mice. And you could also be studying, say, a non-human primate or non-conventional model system like a macaque or marmoset or tree shrew or a variety of other critters. And for many of these in vivo systems, the predominant virus is the AAV, the adeno-associated virus, which is one of the few ones in this list that is actually not associated with a disease, but was found by accident while someone was studying a disease, the adenovirus, of which it is associated with. The AV can infect a large swath of tissue from a single injection, as you can see here from this uh, in vivo calcium imaging, where um, someone has injected an AV expressing GCAMP3 in the primary visual cortex of an awake behaving mouse and done two photon calcium imaging to see the activity of cells in a broad area. You can even more broadly infect 
um, these animals by being able to inject into the bloodstream AAVs and being able to see a variety of different cells infected, not just in the brain, but in a variety of organ systems. In fact, it works better in other organ systems than in the brain. In addition to these particular properties of being able to deliver cargo very well, AV doesn't integrate into the genome, which is particularly important for um, certain clinical uh, gene therapy applications. Because when things integrate into the genome, particularly retroviruses and lentiviruses, they tend to fall into highly expressed genes, which tends to turn them into oncogenes, uh, as well as cause other complications from viral integration. AVs also cause some, but um, often very little uh, immune response when they're infected. So AVs can deliver a variety of cargo, all sorts of transgenes that you'd be interested in. And uh, they're also Cree-inducible, meaning that they can be designed such that they can have a variety of different transgenes that are inducible by the Cree recombinase, which is usually in the mouse line uh, labeling a particular cell type. Also, it is very convenient to use AVs. You can just go to a catalog at many, many different facilities to order it, including our EMBL's very own genetic and viral engineering facility run by Jim, who is also who's here today as well, um, as well as uh, Adgene. And often these facilities are more efficient and provide better titer and a better deal for custom things. Like if you need to do something that uh, isn't in a common catalog that for instance, Adgene would have. Now, two important caveats for AVs. One is that it takes um, two to four weeks for expression. Usually people wait four weeks or more to get a very robust plateau expression. But on the flip side of that, it, it lasts very, very long, like in the order of months to years, as far as people have looked in detail. The biggest downside that should be considered is the cargo limitation. Now you really can only pack in 4.8 KB between the ITRs. And anything more than that, you really start getting a sharp drop off in titers, as well as the inability of your virus to package at all into the capsid. And this is a, this is a real problem. But we're going to talk a lot more about the particularities of AAV and retro and rabies, these first three viruses here in the next lecture. But their AV in particular is so important, I felt that even those of you coming only for this general lecture should get just a broad strokes overview of some of its pros and cons. So moving on to retroviruses. Ah, question. Do AAVs infect non-mammalian model systems? Yes. Yes, they do. Uh, it is unclear to what extent, um, what tissue types would be preferentially infected by which capsids, because there's very different types of capsids that we have in the field using. And even in, like say, a mouse versus a rat, it can infect the different tissues very differently. So what I would suggest if you have a funny system is that you can go to AdGene and you can order like seven tubes of different serotypes that have the same construct that you can then test to see if one of them happens to work well in the tissue and, or and organism that, that you're interested in. And, and it's a discounted price, so it's, it's still like 200 bucks or something like that for the whole series of like a smaller amount. So that's how I would go. You wouldn't just test one, I would test the whole series if you can, but uh, it, it does, no problem. Uh, the example I know of is axolotl, which is a funny amphibian that its limb regenerates. It's um, not Drosophila, not C. elegans. No, there was another one. I think birds do as well, like the zebra finches, people have used that. But anyway, I'm not super 100% on the details, like the source of that. So anyway, yep. All right, so going on to retroviruses, which a lot of people call lentiviruses. And the, um, this is locally injected into the cortex, for instance, in this particular case. And you can see the difference here that the AAV would infect a much larger area and the lentivirus is usually more localized. Uh, it's still expressing at a, at a high level and uh, a, a bit quicker in vivo as well. And the, a plus of the lentivirus is, is that it is allowing for a higher packaging. And it is also allows for the Crelox system to be useful for it. But you have to be careful. I mean, it's, it's a very recombinogenic virus. So you have to really check that it's not recombining on its own uh, from what I've heard. 
And uh, from also I've heard of people's experiences that sometimes this localized nature can be used for its advantage, but it also does not infect as many cells in that area that is infected as the AAV does. So if you wanna, for instance, use chanrodopsin to elicit a behavior from that nuclear cell, the behavior will not be as robust as if you use an AAV, for instance. So now, one thing that, that, and you know, lentiviruses used to be much more used than AAVs before AAVs kind of dethroned it as the, the main viral tool in uh, circuit neuroscience at least. But one place that it's used very often is in development. And there it becomes clear that people are talking about two things in, in a weird way that I want to address because it bog, bugs me every time. Retrovirus is used to imply something like the Maloney murine leukemia virus, which is a retrovirus, meaning it's normally RNA, but then gets turned to DNA. And it, it does not infect post mitotic cells. So if you infect some tissue that's, say, an embryo, you don't have to worry about it infecting post mitotic cells. So you often want to do that if you want to hit progenitor cells or stem cells, whereas the lentivirus are HIV based and they do infect post mitotic cells, like they have the mechanism to bring it into the nucleus. And an example of an experiment on this is that you can do lineage tracing, where you, the a, a difference between lenti and AV is that the lenti, usually single viral particles enter cells, whereas an AV, multiple particles enter the cells and tissue, meaning that you can tighter down the amount of lentivirus and ensure that you only get very small number of viral infections. And then you can mix different colors or unique tags that you can then sequence out in order to, to see all the cells that come from one single infection event. Like here you see a cluster of red cells and a cluster of green cells that derive from infecting developing tissue with a mixture of red and green virus. And of course, there are more sophisticated ways of doing this nowadays with unique tags that they need to sequence from each of the cells to really verify they came from one event. Now, uh, for the rabies virus, it's, it's, a, it's, a vir it's the virus that causes animals to go rabid, like the name implies, you know, frothing mouth and cartoons and all that. And uh, it's, as far as I know, mostly used for a very uh, specific, narrow approach in neuroscience uh, to label circuits where, for instance, let's say you have this imaginary circuit of neurons where neuron A projects to B, projects to C, projects to D. Well, hold on, I can do the laser thing. And let's say you infect the, the cell C with your rabies virus together with the genes required to induce the transsynaptic spread. More detail on, on that next time. And what will happen is that that virus will then jump to the presynaptic cell and then start expressing its genes in cell B, but it will not jump one more to cell A and it will not go forward to D. Now, this tool can be used really powerfully by say expressing the ca calcium sensor in that rabies virus. So you can actually perform calcium imaging on a single starting pyramidal cell and then perform the rabies tracing to label the presynaptic circuit, uh, which is a lot of, but not all, of the presynaptic cells to that starter cell in order to see what is their activity relative to the cell postsynaptic to it. And there are very few tools that can actually do uh, this sort of labeling of uh, uh, like functionally labeling presynaptic inputs, especially to a small number of, of genetically identified cells. The thing about the rabies is that it's not nearly as turnkey as AVs or lentiviruses. And you can buy rabies from uh, the SOC um, uh, but there are a lot more difficulties involved in it than you would encounter with an AAV or lentivirus. So if you're thinking of doing a rabies experiment, I would, I would recommend that you would consider uh, contacting a lab that has done this in the past. So you can get a sense for what sort of difficulties you'll encounter and if you want to actually do this. So another virus that has been used in the past as a transsynaptic tracer, in fact, the, the first one who was, is the herpes simplex virus which um, in, it's the virus that causes cold sores and genital warts in humans. And, it, and this particular strain, H129, um, jumps both presynaptically and postsynaptically, even though it jumps more postsynaptically or anterograde. Uh, and several studies have used it to map entire circuits, like this particular paper have started in the retina and then labeled the entire visual system. 
Uh, the problem with that is that in less than a week, the animal dies of rabies because it's basically spreading, even if you induce the start of the spread with a genetic technique. And recently people have built a monosynaptic one, but it remains to be seen how well it works, how, how good the titers are in terms of being able to if, do this very efficiently and, and so on and so forth. More common than this is using the so-called B strain, I believe, that does not jump, either retrograde or anterograde, but it does produce a lot of protein very fast. Usually, sometimes even in less than a week, sometimes even a few days, depending on the system. So you can see an example here where a small cluster of cells were infected, and they, they did this in particular to look at the, the dendritic spines uh, early in development. So you didn't want to wait four weeks because then development is basically over. Another virus that expresses um, in neuronal tissue and does so extremely quickly is the so-called Synbis virus. And this one's kind of crazy. It can actually uh, infect and label neurons very, very intensely within 36 hours. And, uh, and it labels also very sparsely. It doesn't produce this huge bolus, which allows you to do uh, axonal and dendritic tracing quite well. Uh, unfortunately, because it's such a potent virus, and that's usually a trade-off, the more potent is the virus, the more lethal it is to the cells. So that's the case with this as well. And one technique that is use, using the Synbis is the MAP-seq, where you infect your tissue of interest with Synbis viruses such that each viral particle has a certain tag. So that in, since it is supposed to infect very um, sparsely, you can then section the brain and sequence it and see if single tags are in just one brain area or multiple, suggesting that single neurons in that tissue can go to one brain area or other. It's a fancier way of doing uh, dye tracing. Now, it's, it's actually very important to consider not just viral tools in isolation, because usually they're only really potent and usable nowadays in the context of other options uh, and in combination with other techniques. Uh, one particular example is when you're doing calcium imaging in neuronal tissue to wonder, let's say, if you want to look at pralvobumin cells, PV Cree cells, do you want to infect the, vir the animal with an AAV, for instance, that expresses floxed GCAMP, or do you want to cross it to an animal that expresses GCAMP in the presence of Cree? And they all have their pluses and minuses. I mean, this would be simpler and would have less animal-to-animal -animal variability, which is present even in the systemic delivery of AV, of AV, not just in the local. It has less than the local injection, but it's still there. But this, you know, you also have to breed the animals. You have to have a constant breeding to keep up with your experiments. And it turns out that most people have actually tilted more towards using a combination of fewer genetic lines and a, uh, a, a virus than relying entirely on, on animal models. <clears throat> now, other techniques that are often used with this, like I mentioned before, the single cell electroporation, which works quite well with rabies, even though it's extremely low throughput and, and very laborious. You can also do bulk electroporation, usually in developing tissue because postmitotic cells tend not to like it. And this has the feature of also labeling the cells that are born at a certain particular age. And you can see here in the, the cortex where a certain layer of cells were labeled with one particular elect electroporation, which might be a feature you'd be looking for. Now, this is the, um, we're, we're past the in vivo time. When you work in vitro, either in an acute preparation, which is expected to take only a few hours, or a chronic preparation, which is supposed to take days or months, um, a lot of the things I talked about before apply as well. And, um, and often the best solution is to do a lot of the injections and transgenics and et cetera in vivo and then prepare your tissue. But sometimes you literally can't do that. For instance, when you get tissue from uh, say a tissue bank from patients, or when you have a, a, a model system that you know, you're catching it from the wild or from just a way that you just, these tools are not available yet. And you still want to um, do something in vitro for various scientific reasons. And there, the, 
the, the downsides that were inconveniences when you're working in a pure in vivo model become rate limiting. Like you can't wait oftentimes weeks and weeks and weeks for the AAV to express. So something more like a faster lentivirus or herpes virus becomes more of an option. And many times people often switch to non-viral tools, most famously in neuroscience by just patch clamping, putting an electrode directly into the neural tissue, which allows you a lot of electronic uh, access to the cell, as well as accessing its other cellular compartments. People have also both electroporated organic dyes that are that work in a similar way to genetically encoded calcium indicators. And another uh, property um, technique that you can use is the gene gun, which uses uh, gold particles that have been coated with DNA, and they're shot very quickly with this gun-looking machinery here into cells. It's not, it's not so used in neuroscience anymore, uh, but it's often used in certain other fields, like in plants, it's one of the few ways you can get DNA into chloroplasts, apparently also heard about this preparing for this course. So if you want to work in vitro in cells, ironically, the in vitro slice oftentimes has the worst of both worlds. It has some of the complexity of the in vivo tissue, but your tissue is very quickly dying. Whereas your cells have almost the best of every conceivable world. They are, they are surviving for much longer very stably. They're very easily accessible. And a lot of that is reflected in the viral tools. Like almost every virus really works very well with a variety of different cells. And you can see this with this particular example where um, I took an, an old crappy titer of AV that was left over that expressed a nuclear GFP and, a membrane, and another one expressing membrane tomato. And less than 24 hours later, it very robustly expected. I mean, in fact, we were really trying to get it to express much less so we could get sparser single uh, axons and cells. Now, um, another virus that is actually often used in vitro is for some very different form of application, which is the bacular virus. So bacular virus is a virus that infects insects. And so it is, it is allowed to really modify uh, usually S2, but other insect cells as well. And it's not so much used as a model for any particular basic studies as much as it used for large scale protein production, which is universally used very widely with bacteria. But this particular, <coughs> excuse me, virus and cell system um, is powerful because it has post translational modifications not available to bacteria has a very, and just like the bacteria has high output of a lot of protein per liter of solution. And a lot of these um, quality of life things that really decrease the cost relative to mammalian cells, such as the cells not needing carbon dioxide growing in suspension, serum and room temperature growth. Like basically all you'd want to do if you have a company that's trying to make a lot of protein. And this, this is interesting in particular recently also because as AVs become more of an option for gene therapy and other clinical applications, the reality is that you need a lot more virus to infect a certain patch of human tissue than you would in the mouse or even in the, a primate, like even the macaque. Uh, so you actually need a lot more virus and to produce it in the same scale with these, you know, adherent mammalian cells is generally not feasible when you have huge batch to bat problems and it's just not economically scalable. And people are using this bacular virus system in order to get a lot more viral output, even though that creates certain difficulties in the way that it's not being created as in an in vivo sense as it is with the mammalian cell lines. Another very interesting use recently that was a, I believe it was a very fortuitous accident, which involved viruses, which is the invention of the induced pluripotent stem cells, which um, the Yamanaka group famously was able to take fibroblasts from mice and with only four transcription factors induced with lentiviruses allowed to induce, to create stem cell-like cells from these fibroblasts, which is particularly important because before the only way you could get stem cells was through particularly painful extraction, um, either from the mice or from, from humans, which really limited the wide scale use that they could have. Whereas this, allows them to be taken from the actual patients themselves from just a very simple uh, skin sample. 
And these can be very used for high throughput screens to screen for drugs, even for designer medicine. But people are particularly interested in differentiating tissue that is fixed in some way to what the patient has and then allowing for cell or entire organ transplantation. Now, the problem with that is that these four transcription factors were induced with lentiviruses that have the very interesting property that they can infect these fibroblasts at a low rate. But then when they become stem cells, the, these earlier type cells heavily methylate and then silence these lentiviral constructs that are integrated into the genome, which is great because then now you're, you're no longer overexpressing these things that made it become more progenitor cell-like. But the problem is that now you are differentiating these and you still have these lentiviruses in there. And it's unclear if these might cause cancer. I mean, one of these is a very famous oncogene, CMIC. So people are trying to come up with all sorts of different ways in order to do this induction without having this leftover lentiviral footprint in the genome. And one particular example of this is the Sendai virus, which is an RNA virus. So it since it doesn't have to go through DNA, and it's a positive stranded RNA. So the theory is that it, it can be expressed very quickly because it starts producing protein right away, and it doesn't integrate. It doesn't even go into the nucleus, it is cytoplasmic. So as the cells divide, the, the virus becomes diluted out. But in practice, it turns out to be, to have always complicating details, as these things usually do, in that this particular needs 10 passages to lose the virus, and it actually needs to be passage at 39 degrees Celsius because it's also a temperature sensitive virus, which is also not ideal. Another strategy are uh, bacular viruses, which uh, an example of which is the piggyback transposase, but, but there are others too. Uh, and these are technically not viruses, but they are derived from bacular viral constructs. They even have a lot of the structure and logic that you would find in a viral construct. And this particular virus, it allows for a certain transgene to be inserted into the genome in places that are actually very frequent, the TTAA sequence. But they figured out a way to do it for these cells where you only get a few integrations in the genome. And more importantly, you can also express the transposase that can remove it from the genome at a later time point and not reintegrate in a way that doesn't leave a footprint behind unlike the Cree lock system that always leaves a single lox P or more behind, uh, which is important when you're dealing with human genomes. Now, another interesting complication of this is that it seems like there's an infinity of different strategies to try to get these induced pluripotent stem cells in a way that is, doesn't have these limitations of the lentivirus. But people are now also, let's say that's happening. There are many techniques and one of them will for sure work quite well in the near future. But now people are also inducing these stem cells and or normal stem cells as well into structures called organoids, which are little balls of tissue that seem to have a lot of the structures of more complex tissue like cortical organoids or retinal organoids. And people are very excited about this and the goal of ultimately growing organs that you can then implant into people or even use as, as, a, as models for disease in, in certain screens and so. And then, you start coming up with the same old problems again of how do you actually modify these cells? Of course, the first line of, of uh, alterations that you'll be doing to fix the patients will be at the induction stage with say a bacular virus or this other Sendai virus or some other like injection, direct injection of RNA. You'll be able to also do CRISPR-Cas9 to fix the genetic point mutation or whatever. But as you start wanting to do more sophisticated things and say only the T TB2 positive cells later in development, you're going to start having the same problems that you have in vivo. How do you access the tissue? Do you use an adeno-associated virus, lentivirus, direct injection would not be very high throughput, which defeats one of the big pluses of this whole technique. Um, so I predict that there's a lot of work being done on this, but no one has really found very robust tools to manipulate organoids at a later stage which will be required very soon in order for their usefulness to be really borne out more towards the future, I think. Famous last words to say before like 50 people or something. So, um, 
Now I finally get to, okay, so before I get to cell free systems, are any questions, any more, something someone wants to ask or anything? Nope. Okay, good. Um, all right, so viruses are, are often used without any cells being involved at all, uh, especially earlier on in um, when a lot of the details of molecular biology were being worked out um, in the you know, mid and late 20th century. And this were being done in combination with in vitro systems, uh, often bacterial in vitro systems, also with cell-free systems, such as extracts derived from cells, which usually made things work a lot better, but were a lot less controlled because there were a lot of compounds there that you couldn't control for, and a lot of a purified enzyme-based cell-free systems, which are even to this day are the golden standard of how do you really understand a system because then you add exactly all the components that you think you need. And perhaps the, 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 the biggest star for this entire system is the bacteriophage. These are viruses that infect the bacteria, as their name implies. And there's a variety of different ones. Like basically everything you can imagine that a, a virus can have as a property, the phages have. You have DNA phage, uh, which were actually some of the earliest ones discovered and used by Luria and Delbruck, the so-called T series or the T phage of E. coli. And they have a very strong lytic function, meaning that they very quickly infect the cell and then they produce a lot more other phages and then they quickly burst the cell and, and spread very quickly. And they're very useful in early studies of, of that particular aspect of gene function. Its opposite almost is the temperate phage, um, most famously the bacteriophage lambda. And this one represses the lytic function and instead integrates into the genome uh, in, and has a much more pronounced lysogenic phase where it stays dormant. And this was very useful for a variety of other reasons that I don't have time to go into. And it was involved in the production of the first recombinant DNA molecule in 72. There's also small DNA phage. A lot of these phages are very large genomes. And uh, some of these smaller ones have as few as 10 to 12 proteins. And this particular one was the first organism with the fully, where this full sequence was obtained, which at the time was actually very important technically for working with these, um, these organisms. Uh, lastly is the RNA phage, which was one of the few ways that uh, cell-free protein synthesis was be found to mediated by mRNA. Now, uh, as I was writing this, I didn't want to leave you with the idea that this is like an old foggy biology that we don't need to worry about anymore because you know, phages are just a huge part of life. Like in, in the oceans, they turn over something like 10 to 20% of the entire weight of the ocean in some ludicrously short amount of time. And uh, understanding its biology has yielded a lot of very interesting things. Most recently, uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is a mechanism used by bacteria to pervade, prevent phage infection including all the particular nuances of how the phage is able to avoid that infection. Uh, and this also goes back to almost the greater point of this is that almost nothing that we use in biology we've basically discovered from just thin air, the brilliance of humanity. We are basically just taking something that nature is doing and tweaking it for our own uses. Now, with that, I'd like to go on to talk about how you can kind of put viruses in a few little boxes mostly because oftentimes viruses will be talked in this way. And just so you know, you're not really super duper missing a lot out on this. You can have, you can split up your viruses by their genome, if it's DNA or RNA, so it could be double-stranded or single-stranded. You could have uh, RNA that's, that's positively stranded, so protein gets popped up right away, negatively stranded, which requires positive to be produced, and then negative, and so on and so forth. You have, a double-stranded RNA that's non-segmented, just one big thing, where you can have different little segments. Now, outside of the DNA, you have um, a, a protein shell called the capsid, which encases the, the genetic information of the virus. It could either be a repeating helix that forms in a little coil, or called a bullet or, or filament, depending on how it looks like. You can also have a little little ball that is actually an icosahedron formed of like triangles or, or subunits that form larger triangles. 
Or you can have kind of the best of both worlds, which is one on top of the other, or so-called head tail, which in fact was what some of the earlier phages were found to look like, where you can see here the icosahedral head, filamentous tail, and they additionally had these little filamentous arms that allow for additional attachment to the cell, to the bacteria. In addition to that, outside of this protein capsid, a lot of viruses outside of it have what is called an envelope, which is the phospholipid bilayer that they usually get from the cell that they're infecting, where they don't actually just burst out of the cell, capsid floating around, but they actually pinch away some of the membrane and take it from their own. And that's considered envelope viruses, whereas viruses that just have the capsid are non-enveloped. And you can imagine how this would be useful to like avoid the immune system because you're basically wearing a disguise of the cell that you're just leaving. That being said, the AAV is not enveloped and it's one of the least, um, you know, least immune uh, affecting viruses that we have. So, you know, that goes on to the greater thing that if you start putting the viruses that I briefly mentioned so far, as well as some other ones that are disease relevant, and you try to make sense of any particular biological or medical or application logic from this and just it, it doesn't really hold true like you can come up with certain truisms like oh you know a, a plus stranded rna virus would express very fast and kill the cell very quickly but i can almost guarantee you that for any statement like that there are a hundred of viruses in nature that actually don't do that there might even be some in someone's freezer that no one bothered to publish because they didn't find it would be very useful. So um, this is basically it. Thank you all for listening. I am attaching again the um, doodle for the next lecture as well as the survey for how this lecture went. Um, it should only take like two minutes. It's, it's really, really short to fill out. And I would like to leave you with this little list of reviews that might be useful and and you probably can't read this now you could probably screenshot this if you want some of this and i'll just leave this up as i have some final questions and if not you can also i'll find out the place to put this up later so you can look at it with more um, more calmly any interaction with endogenous virus which are sorry what do you what do you mean il yeah, what I mean is that uh, there are endogenous retroviruses that are expressed in different cells. So when we use these uh, viruses, they, do they have any kind of interaction? Or is, if they can activate also this virus, and this virus sometimes they can be oncogenic. So is there any kind of information if these endogenous retroviruses that are expressed in our normal cells can have some kind of interaction with this virus? Mm. So that's a good question. I, um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, I'm guessing not because a lot of these viruses that we use as tools have been extensively uh, gutted of all of their viral genome components. Like the AAV has six coding sequences inside its genome normally, and we have none of them in the AAVs we use in the lab. Uh, same thing for the lentivirus between its ITRs, it just has the genes of interest and it has proteins around that will allow that particular construct to enter the nucleus and into the genome. And it is conceivable that some of those proteins might conceivably make their way to the nucleus and do something there, but I, I don't necessarily, I think that would be very unlikely to put it, put it mildly. It's a very small amount of protein that is already dedicated to the viral construct that needs to do its effector function. And it might be the case for sure if you're amplifying the virus in vivo. Like if you're rabies and you're jumping and you have something in there that is like a rabies, something as a virus associated with rabies could trans complement some of the rabies genes that you're expressing, like the L protein, the M protein, the N protein, and then that could cause something. But definitely not a problem for lentis, definitely not a problem for uh, AVs or for any virus basically that is gutted of most of its um, genetic information. As far as I can predict, phage for sure would, would interact. A lot of the phage is maintained when you use it. I mean, they're like 100 KB. So Jim, did you want to talk more about this? No. Sorry, I couldn't get it to turn on. Yeah, um, I yeah, I was just going to mention that, just to point out that we know phage uh, 
different phage interact with each other. So it's, it's a good point to think about. So there's many cases where if a cell's been infected with one, one virus and then another virus in, infects it, various things happen. And um, so it is worth keeping that in mind. But as, as you said, most, we got out most of the, the virus before we use it for our biology anyway, so. Do you know if these are some of these, these small phages, uh, like the, um, or, or, or one of the, the particularly well, big well, ones? Like Lambda, we, we did that with Lambda intentionally. Mm -hmm. So you, can, would, you would set up these situations where you call it a heteroimmune phage. So you only want to infected cells that already had a, 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 a Lambda in there and you could set up situations like that. Gotcha. So for the next question is, um, do viruses cross the blood-brain barrier? For labeling neurons in vivo, can you comment on the efficiency of local injection versus global bloodstream extraction? So the only virus that I know that does this very efficiently is the AAV, serotype 2.9, which got improved, war, improved by, by the Garin Daru lab which was actually what I showed in one of my earlier slides, which I am moving over here. Here. This, this reference here. This virus works very, very well, particularly their second generation one in the 2017 paper, this uh, PHP-EB. And it's actually a very easy injection. You just inject it to the back of the eye where it has a plexus of blood vessels. You don't need to tail vein. And uh, it's, it's actually quite efficient. It, it, might, it might not be as good as, your, as a local injection, but a lot of labs have switched to, over to doing this because it's just so much more convenient and there is less animal to animal variability. Okay, so I think we're done a little bit early here. Uh, thank you again for everybody. It was a pleasure to do this. Uh, apologize for the little bit of awkwardness. It, it feels very weird talking to my empty living room and then sort of seeing all these faces here. But uh, all right, I'm closing the thing. There's never no awkward way of not doing this. All right, bye-bye everybody.